Welcome to Zion Presbyterian Church in Charlottetown on May 17th, 2020. My name is Douglas Rolvaga, I'm minister here at Zion, and whether this is your first time joining us or whether you've been with us from the very beginning, we are glad that you're here as we worship together. A few announcements just before we begin. While our building and sanctuary is closed, we are providing opportunities for worship through these Sunday services, as well as previous Sundays, which, which can be accessed through our website, Facebook, or YouTube channels. And we're providing opportunity for study as well with short daily videos called Reading the Gospels Together. And this week, we're starting in on the Gospel of Luke. We provide opportunities for prayer through daily postings of readings and prayers. And if there are special needs for which you would like us to pray, please call or drop us an email. Our contact information is on our website and our Facebook page, and we would love to hear from you. We provide resources for families with children through our website and Facebook page as well. And there are lots of activities and some really, really fun videos, which more than just children will enjoy. Sadly, our office is still closed until protocols are lessened. Details on how to contact our office or how to contact me for pastoral care, emergencies, or concerns are all on our website. Importantly, you'll find there the ways in which you can continue to contribute to the ongoing ministry at Zion, and we are very, very grateful for your faithful support. Following our call to worship, we have an opening hymn, Thou Whose Almighty Word. And the words will be on your screen, and I encourage you to sing along. If you're not inclined to sing, take this opportunity to focus on the words and prepare your heart to worship. God bless you, and let's worship God together. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it together. Let's join our hearts and our voices in song as the organ plays Thou Whose Almighty Word. Let's join our hearts together with our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray. Father, you are the one true God, whom to know is life eternal, and whom to serve is joy and peace. You have created all that is. The whole universe testifies to the majesty and power of you, its maker. We praise you, God of all creation. And we praise you, Lord God, for you have come to us in Jesus Christ, your Son, bringing salvation through a new covenant entered by faith. We praise you, God of our salvation. We praise you, Lord God, for you continue to come to us by the Holy Spirit, your presence in the world, our comfort, our source of faith. 
We praise you, God of our renewal. We praise you, Lord God, for you continue to come to us through the Scriptures, the Old and New Testaments, witness to your mighty acts. And through them, you reveal your holy love and lead us to Jesus Christ. We praise you, God of revelation. This day and all days from homes and hospitals, apartments and care centers, with the one church universal, we praise and worship you as one God, eternal Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three, equal in power and glory. The Father to whom we come, the Son through whom we come, the Spirit by whom we come. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, for as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. As we enter your presence, Father, we're conscious of our unworthiness before you. We confess that we are sinners. We do not care for the world as we should. We do not fulfill our calling to serve you. We do not care for one another. Our lives do not reflect your love for us all and for our world. This failure is sin, a rebellion against you, our God, and an insistence that we be God in our own lives. We do not love you, our God, without reserve, nor do we love our neighbors as ourselves. And so forgive us our sins, we pray. Hear our silent prayers, O Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. God's way to salvation has been revealed in Jesus Christ. Through the death and the resurrection of Christ, our sins are forgiven. And salvation means life, healing, wholeness, and forgiveness. It comes from God's grace revealed to us through Christ alone and received through faith in him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our scripture readings are from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. As God has spoken through these words in the past, so God speaks by the power of the Holy Spirit to our hearts today. So listen for God's word to you. John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said. I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, 
the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. You can go there today. You can travel to Jerusalem, enter the old city through the Lion's Gate, walk maybe 100 meters, go through an entrance on your, on your right, come into the lovely garden complex of St. Anne's Church, and there they are, large as life, the very spot where our story from John took place, the breathtaking pools of Bethesda. You can stand at the edge and look down and marvel at how big, how deep these pools are, larger, deeper than any Olympic pool. Mind you, they don't, they don't look much like they did in the days of Jesus. Actually, they don't even look like pools anymore. They're ruins now, ruins on top of ruins. But the archaeologists have been busy. They've cleared away the centuries of rock and dirt and fill, and, and there they are. It's a few displays with pictures of what these pools would have looked like back then, 2,000 years ago. The pools were for supplying water to the thirsty city. They were also public baths to wash and prepare yourself to enter the holy place. But the pools were also known as a place of healing. When fresh water from the, the northern pool, a reservoir, was released into the southern pool, a ritual bath, the water would bubble up, and it was thought that the healing power was greatest at that very moment. Perhaps people thought perhaps an angel had just touched the water. So the first person in had the best chance, it was thought, of being miraculously healed. And not only did people believe this in the days of Jesus. Later, the Romans built temples to their healing god, Asclepius, around the pool. Byzantine Christians built an enormous church right over top of the pools, and the Crusaders built their own holy hospital there, too. And as a result of all these massive constructions and the neighborhood growing close around, you really have to stretch your imagination to picture the scene with Jesus and the man who had been an invalid for so very, very long. The pools have changed, but people haven't. And Jesus hasn't either. And so the story is important to us today. And I'll tell you why in a bit. Jesus and the disciples have traveled to Jerusalem for a feast, a religious holy day. Like countless other pilgrims, they stop at the pools of Bethesda to prepare themselves before they enter the grounds of the temple. It's a majestic sight, the, the vast pools, the sparkling water, the roofed colonnades providing shade from the hot sun. Less majestic, perhaps, are the dozens of blind, lame, afflicted, even paralyzed souls waiting for a healing touch, waiting for the waters to bubble, a sign that the power was at its peak, and then the rush to be first in the water. Jesus and the disciples stand and watch and wonder. There's one among the infirm to whom Jesus is drawn, one he's told who had been an invalid for, for 38 years. How many times in those 38 years had this man come to this pool for healing? How many hours, how many days had he, had he been here now laying upon his mat of straw, thin comfort from the hard stone beneath? And Jesus approaches this man and, and looks upon him, and, and as Jesus does, he looks into him, and he sees his heart, and he sees his need, and he asks him the strangest question imaginable. Do you want to be well? The man's been an invalid for 38 years. He's come to the pool. He's hoping. He's waiting for an unlikely miracle. He's hoping for a healing. He's desperate for his life to be changed. And now this one comes to him and asks, do you want to be well? So the man blinks, he's puzzled, looking up at his, at his questioner. Who would ask such a thing? Isn't the answer obvious? Can any answer be more obvious? 38 years his life has been burdened by this infirmity. 38 years of frustration and difficulty and exclusion. Does he want to be well? Well, with admirable patience, the man answers, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up while I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Did you notice the man didn't actually answer the question? Jesus has, had asked, do you want to be well? The man answered with a description of the process, an outline of his complaint, but he doesn't answer the question which Jesus 
actually asks. Instead, like so many of us do, he answers with a complaint. I'm not fast enough to get to the water in time. But the complaint concerning the immediate problem of getting in the water is not what Jesus is primarily concerned about. Jesus, as he always does when speaking to people, is not going to the surface, but he's going to the heart of their problem. Jesus is addressing the deepest need of their spirit and the deepest need of their heart. And each time, people don't get it. Each time, focused on their immediate problem, their immediate need, people don't get what Jesus is addressing. And so focused on his complaint, what this man wants is for Jesus to throw him into the pool. While what Jesus had offered was to make him whole. For when you really look at the question Jesus asked the man, you begin to see what he's offering. And it's more than physical healing. What Jesus offers is to make the man whole, not just well, as in our translation. The word John uses is whole, complete. Do you want to be made whole? And that's a big difference. You see, the man had been infirm for 38 years, as we'd heard, and the word used for infirm is asthenia, a weakness, a debilitation, a chronic loss of strength. One day, perhaps, he found himself unable to do the work he once did. He was so tired. Then, sometime later, he found it difficult to even stand up from the table. One fateful day, he was unable even to rise from his bed to care for his personal needs, to reach for a glass of water. 38 years. Now, eventually he'd gotten someone to bring him to the pool, a last-ditch effort perhaps to find healing, but now he lies by the pool alone. His family, his friends had largely given up upon a healing, largely given up upon him. What does 38 years of this do to someone? What does it do to their spirit? What does it do to their heart? And so Jesus doesn't ask the man if he wants to be healed. Jesus asks him a bigger thing. He asks him if he wants to be made whole, to be released not just from the infirmity which plagues him, but from the damage of heart and spirit, the internal scars which the years of sorrow have carved. Now, the man, of course, misses this. Fixated upon his physical problem, he outlines only the difficulty there. He can't even see the deeper damage that long years of sorrow have caused within him. But Jesus sees, and he asks the man, do you want to be made whole? And then he says to the man, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And a miracle, instantly the man was healed, says our translation. Instantly cured, says another. That's not what John wrote. John wrote, made whole. Immediately the man was made whole, not just healed, made whole. Now, I said earlier that this story is important to us here in 2020 Charlottetown and beyond, not just to some old fellow in Jerusalem long ago. And it's important to us because right now, if you ask just about anyone what their big problem in life is, they'll say, uh, COVID-19 and the isolation protocols attached to it. And that's a problem. For some, really, it's, it's been not much more than an inconvenience. For others, it has been absolutely devastating. But what this whole situation has done, what has made it so difficult for so many, is that it has amplified all the other problems which are hampering our sense of wholeness. Some people have told me that it's put their problems in perspective More frequently, I'm told that problems which were once peripheral to daily life, kind of a nagging sense of disquiet, have become, in our current situation, overwhelming. Scrimping, scrimping, but somehow never making ends meet. A marriage growing ever more cold less and less communication between us and our kids, or or an argument with a family member, with a friend that just won't go away. Warnings from our doctor, don't smoke this, don't drink that, start doing this, stop eating that. And we can't seem to change our behavior, we just want to give up. Addictions that we promise every day to overcome, yet which every day we seem to succumb to. 
aches and pains increasingly preventing us from doing what we want to do, then need to do, then over time the aches and pains are becoming a true disability and infirmity until it seems as though we can't do anything at all. These are problems, the real problems. And our COVID-19 world and the accompanying protocols are amplifying their effect. But many of these problems which we identify are external. What these problems are doing to us deep inside, what they're doing to our soul, our spirit. Do we ever consider that? This damage, this scarring, this incompleteness is the kind of thing Jesus recognizes in the heart and soul and spirit of the man at the side of the pool. Do you want to be made whole? I, I, can't, I can't do anything about this problem, says the man. But Jesus can, and he does. Immediately the man became whole. Not just healed, made whole which is a much bigger thing, because you can be healed and still not be whole. And yet you can be infirm in body and yet be whole. Let me explain. I know and you know people who have no physical or financial or social challenges, but they're miserable. They're physically fit, Maybe they're even attractive, maybe financially well-off, secure employment, well-connected socially, all the things that are supposed to make you happy, but they're not. We've seen it all. Gossip magazines and tabloid TV shows are filled with the stories of the talented and beautiful and wealthy who end up in rehab or divorce courts or highly publicized flame-outs or, God forbid, find themselves victims of suicide, victims of their own internal brokenness, their terminal spiritual asthenia. On the other hand, I know, and you know, people who are infirm or who have limitations or disabilities or challenges, and yet who have within them a core of optimism, of cheerfulness, of concern for others, of contentment, of joy. Sure, they'd much rather not have their limitations, and their limitations are a constant challenge, but still somehow deep inside, they're well, truly deeply well. And they inspire us, and we wonder, if I had their struggles, I would be bitter and miserable. I would make everybody around me bitter and miserable, or I'd die trying. But these people aren't like that. Despite their circumstances, they are nonetheless whole. And they are. Because wholeness is far more a spiritual matter than it is an economic or, or physical issue. And Jesus knew that. He made a point of it time and again. We could mention so many more instances, but let me bring you back for a brief moment to another man long and firm. This man, who we first find in Mark chapter 2, was, was lowered through the roof of a house in Capernaum to be close to Jesus. And what does Jesus say to this man, this paralyzed man, so obviously in need of physical healing? Jesus says, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And only then, having dealt with the man's wholeness, is his physical healing addressed. But this wholeness, this forgiveness, this healing of the spirit, that came first. That was the more important thing. Now, as an example, long before COVID, I visited a man in Emerge, something with his heart. How are you, I asked, and he went on for five minutes, pretty upset about how they made him sit in the waiting room for what seemed like ages before anybody took a look at him. I tried again. Well, well but how, how are you? And he asked me if I ever spent a night in emergency on an uncomfortable stretcher, nobody paying much attention to you, having to beg the nurses for a glass of water. Yeah, I listened. And then I asked again, how are, how are you? And this time it got through. And his eyes filled with tears. And he said, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of dying. 
And then, and, and only then, were we able to pray. To pray not only that he be healed, but that his fears be stilled and his soul and his spirit find peace, that he be made whole. Do you want to be made whole? Do you? You may not have had a debilitating illness for 38 years, but long-held frustrations, limitations, humiliations, disappointments, compromises, failures, addictions, defeats, grief, all exacerbated by the impact of COVID-19. They may well have caused injuries to your mind and soul and spirit. You're plagued by self-criticism, by a glass-half-empty view, by stubborn pride or lack of energy or lack of motivation or lack of desire or enthusiasm or joy. Your relationships with others are marred by suspicion and a negative attitude, by an accumulation of resentments and slights and offenses. The smallest thing defeats you. Your attitude is one of constant complaint. You harbor deep-set deep fear not only of the, of the present, but the increasingly uncertain future. This damage, this scarring, this lack of inner peace is a sign of inner woundedness, of spiritual incompleteness. You may not be lying on a mat by a pool waiting for an unlikely miracle, but you need the touch of Jesus nonetheless. Do you want to be made whole? You can make excuses. I have no one to put me into the pool when the water's stirred up. While I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. There are always excuses. But ultimately, what you need to do is to reach up to the hand of Jesus and invite, accept, and welcome the wholeness he brings. And let the healing begin. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. Took up his bed, the symbol, the very symbol of his infirmity, the prison upon which he for so long lay. He took up his bed and he walked. You can reach out to Jesus right here, right now, and ask him to make you whole. And right here, right now, that healing can begin. That process can get underway. And you can rise up from where you are today, changed, healed, made whole. COVID-19 or no COVID-19, protocols or no protocols, you can be made whole whole. Reach up to Jesus and invite, accept, welcome the wholeness he brings and let your healing begin. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Join with me in our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Dear God, whom to know is to love, and whom to love is to find true life, you have invited us to pray to you, and so this morning we do that in and through the good and strong name of Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you for bringing meaning, purpose, and wholeness to our lives in a world which so often seems to be empty of meaning, where violence, selfishness, and greed seem to be the only constants. We thank you for revealing to us the deep meaning behind all of life, that there is a God who loves us and seeks to bring healing to the world, who seeks to bring us home. In a world where for many there is no purpose beyond moving from paycheck to paycheck, we thank you that you have given us a high purpose, the call to live in love of God and of neighbor. In a world where emptiness of spirit plagues so many lives, where people turn to drugs and distractions to fill the ache within, we thank you that you bring healing and wholeness, giving your Holy Spirit to fill our lives with your very presence. We thank you, Father, for meaning and for purpose and for wholeness. You, O oh Lord, make us complete. We pray for all unhappy lives, those who are bitter and resentful, feeling life has given them a raw deal, those who are sensitive to criticism and quick to take offense, those who desire their own way, whatever the inconvenience or cost to others, May your judgment and mercy be for their healing. We pray for those who live with bitter regrets, for loving relationships brought to ruin, for opportunities freely given yet woefully abused, for the bitterness of defeat or betrayal at another's hand, or for failure in personal integrity. May your grace give new hope to find victory in the very scene of failure. We pray especially this day for all who are in illness, pain, or fear, weary of the day, and fearful of the night. Grant them healing, and at all times, through faith, the gift of your indwelling peace. And Father, we pray for those who grieve. O God, whom to know is to love, and whom to love is to find true life, hear our prayer and through our prayers, inspire us to bring healing and hope to our community and our world, in and through the good and strong name of Christ Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen and Amen. And now may the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.
He will come and save you. Say to the weary one, your God will surely come. He will come and save you. He will come and save you. again. He will come and save you. Say to those who are broken hearted, not lose your faith. The Lord your God is strong, and with his loving arms, when you call on his name, he will come and save. He will come and save. save you. He will come and save you. Lift up your eyes to him. You will arise again. He will come and save